I'm going to get going because I know we're running late because the schedule got pushed back and I don't want to be interrupting you uh, for beer and, or what is it, Belgian water, as you were saying. Um, I'm going to sit down a bit, so most is on the screen. Uh, you don't have to worry. I showed you this video. Who am I? I'm a hacker. I work on config management things. Hey, settle down. I'm giving a talk here. <laughs> you want a battery for the mic or you don't? Uh, battery? Yeah, if that battery dies, do you want a replacement or not? I don't know. I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> all right. It's like MGMT. Make sure we have redundancy. All right, all right. That's Chris. Uh, <laughs> I got some Chris slides later, so you better come back. So I read a technical blog called The Technical Blog of James. Who's seen it? Just raise your hand. Uh, same joke. If you haven't seen it, raise your hand anyway, so I seem really popular. More and more hands. Um, I've actually moved it to a new domain. So if you're following me on WordPress, this is actually the new domain. You might want to check it out. I'm actually a physiologist by training, so if you have some cardiology questions, we can talk about it. And obviously, I'm a big DevOps believer. So just some background. Um, I used to do a lot of puppet stuff, and for years, people were telling me uh, not to sort of reinvent the wheel. Um, and, but the thing is, I didn't want this reel. Uh, it's not to diss Puppet, it's just I learned so much stuff with Puppet and I tried to add things to Puppet, but architecturally it just wasn't working for me. So I wanted to build the newer wheel. Um, and the question is, was the existing wheel really good enough for what I wanted to do? I don't know. So um, this is really what I came up with, ultimately. It's my nope guy, I bring him everywhere. Who's heard of MGMT, by the way? Just raise your hand. Great. Who's really shy and hates raising their hand in audiences? Just let me know where you are. They're spread all over the room. So anyway, so long story short, you all know now MGMT. I'm going to assume you're pretty good at config management, so I'm going to go pretty quickly. We have a logo, and if you come up at the end, I even have some stickers for you. Um, we have two main parts to the, to the tool. We have the engine, and we have the language. Um, the engine I've presented previously, and today I'm really going to focus on the language, uh, which I think is sort of the interesting thing. Um, the, the engine, just to sort of recap in case um, you haven't seen MGMT before, it has three main design principles. It runs in parallel, it's event-driven, and it works as a distributed topology, which, uh, again, I've showed in previous talks. These are the sort of resource graphs that run on the engine. Uh, the blue boxes represent, you know, file, package, service, EC2 resource, or anything like that. The black arrows... Uh, represent dependencies between them, so require, before, that sort of thing. And the red arrow is a topological source. That just means traditional tools do one thing at a time and they go through this graph. Um, MGMT can run in parallel and that is actually quite helpful for some other things. Um, and I'm not going to show you that. I'll show you just sort of the original demo that I first showed at MGMT, but now in the language. So if I actually have this hello... I'm going to show this example. So I have this hello Belgian, uh, hello Belgium example. So I just run this on the left. And I look over here, you can see it's actually created this hello file. Um, and you know, same sort of thing as last time. If you remove it, it actually comes right back. Remove the file, comes right back. Um, and it actually is super, super efficient. So you can even, if you actually remove the file and cat the file, as fast as you do it, it just comes right back. Um, and you can even do sort of things, if you know the watch command, watch just lets you run something over and over again really, really quickly. So if I just run this, is it big enough for everyone to see? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, if you even just run watch very, very quickly, you can see that the engine actually wakes up, does the work, and fixes the state in real time. So that's what we do in the language. Um, and that's the basics. So again, still engine stuff. We can do this for all sorts of things, files, packages, services, um, EC2 resources, uh, virtual machines, all sorts of crazy stuff. And I made the statement a little while back that this is what I consider config management to be. The things that didn't do this sort of stuff was an earlier version, but I think this is fundamentally config management. But the config management that I believe it is contains another technology as well. And that technology for me, does anyone know what I'm getting at or you've seen this before? You can scream it out. Don't be shy. There will be no fire if you get it wrong. So I think this is sort of like monitoring. So if you're good sysadmins, you put things into production, you uh, do all the configuration, and then you set up monitoring, right? Before you put it into production? You all do this? Maybe. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. So if we can build in some sort of, if we can build this in a little bit per resource, then hopefully it's a little bit easier for you. Um, I've showed you a bunch of topology stuff. Um, this is sort of how uh, Puppet does things. What's this topology called? Scream it out. Client server. Client server, that's right. What's the problem with this topology? 
It's a bottleneck for performance, so if you had a lot of clients all connecting, it can also be another thing, which is a... Ruby Rails. Uh, no. A single point of failure, that's right. Uh, this is a slightly different topology, uh, which is a central orchestrator. So when you have one thing that connects to a bunch of machines, that's what that is. Um, what are problems with this topology? Yeah, same as before, single point of failure, performance, and so on. So um, we don't do this. We actually do this in MGMT. We build in etcd, and we actually have a core of machines. Hey, what do you need? He needs a microphone. We have a core of machines that actually interconnect and autonomously form or automatically form this etcd cluster. Um, and they all actually expose that database for use in our tool. And then any other peer connects to any one of those machines. And that allows us to use them to exchange data. And if one of them dies, it's not a problem because another one can be re-elected as a primary machine in the cluster. And I'm just going to show you what this sort of exchange pattern looks like. Um, so I'm going to run multiple MGMT all on my same laptop. And just to trick them, I'm going to give them this, this host name argument so that they think that they're running on separate hosts. And then over here on the left, uh, excuse me, on the right, you're actually going to see what's happening. So I'm going to just run one at a time. I'm going to start it up. And there we go. And you can see that it actually, I'm just going to remove this stuff. It creates a file. And if I just watch that, I'm just going to watch. I'm just going to run a tail in uh, a loop just so you can see what's happening. So this is the first machine. And what I've actually programmed each machine to do, kind of like exported resources in a way, is I've asked each machine to generate a random string and to push it into this database. And I've also asked each machine to read everything in the database and just print it out into a file resource so we can actually see it. And currently, you just see now we have this map, which has uh, just one host name, h1, and the random string that it generated. And if I actually start up a second one, if you want to see what I'm actually running here, all I'm doing is I'm running MGMT, I'm pointing it at this code, which I'll show you later, I'm telling it hostname h2, and then all I do is I point it at any existing host in the cluster. So I just give it the IP address of anyone that's there. The rest is just stuff, this is debug info, uh, sort of dev environment things, and these are just different ports because I'm running them all on the same machine, so I actually have to give them different ports to run on. And if I run this, press enter, very quickly you now see that the first machine sees H1 and H2, and the second machine sees both of them as well. So kind of like exported resources on steroids, but in the language. And we can actually do this again if we want to run a third one. Oops. If I run a third one, watch how fast they react. Under a second, sort of, the third one starts up. It knows about everyone else, and the first two also wake up and react to everyone else. So this is actually a few things. This can actually be a service discovery pattern. So you don't have to know before you actually start everything up where the IPs are and who's going to be there and what IP addresses to use. You can automatically just exchange this information. And for building things like a load balancer that has a whole bunch of web servers behind it, they can automatically discover that, say, hi, I'm a web server. Please add me to your load balancer and do that in real time. Is anyone completely lost so far? If you are, let me know. If not, I'm going to carry on because I have more demos to show you. Cool? Yeah, I see some smiling faces, so I think I'm going to go on. I'm just going to kill these really quickly. OK. So I have showed you this stuff. So here's basically the defining principle of what I wanted to build in the language. I want to build really powerful, robust systems. Um, I don't know who this gentleman is personally, but apparently a dead computer scientist. But anyways, so the language has some important properties that I was looking into. I want the language to be safe, because I don't want to blow away a whole data center if I make an off by one error. So that would be very bad. I want the language to be very powerful, and I want it to be really easy, uh, I want it to be easy to reason about. So by looking at the code, obviously you should have great testing and great infrastructure to make sure of all that, but you want to actually also be able to see the code and understand and model what's happening in distributed systems, and particularly over time. So they have a lot of properties. Um, here's some of them, but I think I'm actually just going to show you uh, in particular. So here's an example that I'm going to actually show you. Just actually run this right here. Oops. So I'm going to run this example on the left, and I'm just going to run this watch in a loop. And what's actually happening is the language itself is something called a reactive language. So it actually runs in real time and produces a, re a stream of resource graphs. So if you look what's happening right here, we have over here this year value. So just some integers multiplied together. 
And then we add that to this date, or, date and time function, which is a built-in function. And then that result, which should be whatever the date, time, and seconds from a year from now is, because we add that here, stored here. And we put that into this big struct. We also have this load function down here, which we store in a variable, and then put it into a struct, and some other stuff. And then we just have this big template, kind of like inline temp template in Puppet, which we put into a file resource. Okay? But if we look at how that's actually running, this over here on the right, this is just me running the watch. So you can see what the file contents actually are. And if you look, this is actually changing. So the, every second, it turns out every second, the date time function decides, hey, the date time is different and produces a new number of seconds since 1970, because that's how dates are represented. And so it pushes, it recalculates the program only efficiently calculating what it needs to do because of what has changed. And then it spits out all that stuff into this text file. The load value you'll actually see is changing as well because the load on the Linux kernel changes every five seconds and a new value pops out into our language. It reevaluates what's necessary. And at the end of the day, it realizes that it needs a new resource, a new file resource with different contents. It then pushes that to the engine and you see that right away. We've got a quick question over here. Yeah. And only if the data has changed in the cache that you update the DOM? Uh, sort of. Um, I'll get into internals tomorrow if you want. Okay, but uh, basically, think of it like a big spreadsheet. And if you update one column, it knows what needs to get updated everywhere. And ultimately, the values, the expressions, go in and build the actual resources, so all the different types that are necessary. Um, here's this other funny thing at the bottom. So it turns out, because you have this real -time, these real-time functions, you can actually even build things that respond to real-world events, like uh, the volume. So I've actually built a VU meter function, which actually is using my computer microphone to detect the sound in the room. And if, it's, if we're really quiet, you see it's very low. But if we make a lot of noise, you can see that it actually shows you in real time what's happening. So just for fun, let's be really quiet, and then when I point to you, I want you to make as much noise as possible and see if we can make this thing peak. Are you ready? Very good, yeah. So, I mean, this is just a silly thing for a demo, but you could actually think about this. We want to model these real-time systems based on real properties. So for a crazy idea, you could have this uh, microphone in your office, and if it was really loud, maybe that meant that there was fighting or something, so you could automatically you know, set your file server to read-only so that you don't like <laughs> do something in anger or any other crazy thing that you want to imagine. Um, my goal is not to actually tell you what you should build. My goal is to give you the tools and a language for you to safely describe these things, and then you be, uh, use your imagination and build those sorts of things. Do you like this? Yes. Okay. Do you want to see some more demos? Yes. No? Yes. All right. Okay, good. So let's see some more demos. So I told you now, oops, oops, ah, uh, spoiling, there's a LibreOffice bug that doesn't let you go backwards sometimes. Oh, goodness. All right, so I told you that we have these variables that change over time. But the cool thing about this is that um, since they change over the time, we can actually tell what the previous values of those variables were as well. So in this example right here, I've done the syntax highlighting manually because building a new language, you don't get colors for free yet. Um, <laughs> kind of annoying. So I have that date time function again, and I'm just storing that in a variable. And then over here, I'm binding to these four different variables, date time, curly brackets, special syntax, 0, 1, 2, and 3. And what those indexes are, those are the indexes meaning I want the current value, the previous value, the value before that, and so on. And we're actually looking back into the past. And then basically I just print those out in a big template. And if we run this, oops, I'm just going to run this on the left. And over here, again, I just printed those out to a file for you to see that's actually happening. If I run this, you'll actually see um, I printed out the, all of them in a row, so you can see there's the current time, a second ago, a second ago, a so, second ago, and so on, and they're constantly updating. So now hopefully you believe me that this is possible. And this is possible with any variable in the whole language. Make sense? Cool. Let's do something a little bit harder. Um, so what is this? You all know. You've probably seen this before. Scream it out. 
It's a thermostat. It's from Canada. My parents took it, which is why the photo looks like garbage. You can see that it has the correct units of Celsius on there. I have a slightly clearer photo, which is unfortunately in obscure units, uh, but just so you can see what's happening. And these thermostats have a particular property, which um, some of you might know about. Um, does anyone know what this property is, besides keeping your house warm? Hysteresis. Hysteresis. Did you see it on my slides before when I was changing it? You did? Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But the, the truth is, the property is called hysteresis. And what does that really mean? This is actually a property we all know and understand. We just don't think about it as much. So for example, if we're in a room and we have the heater on, the heater is going to go up until we get to, say, 20 Celsius or something, the set point, and perhaps turn off, because the room is warm enough now. But it's quite cold outside, so the temperature is going to drop back down. And the second it gets below 20, if there's no hysteresis, it would click back on and then turn itself back on and then hit the 20 and then go right back down. And it would actually flap back and forth very, very quickly, which is not really what we want. And so um, with hysteresis, we can actually program it to potentially go up to 20. And then when it hits 20, turn off and then wait till it goes all the way dropping down past uh, 19 to 18. And then when it gets just below 18, then we click back on and then we go all the way back up until we get to 20 and then we click back off. So we actually have a threshold there and that can introduce a delay and actually make it so we don't flap back and forth very, very quickly. And that basically requires you to know the historical values and that's why we have hysteresis. So just a quick example of this. Do you want to see a demo of this? Yes. No? Yes? yes? yes. I'm trying, I'm trying here. At the end of the day, so I'm a bit tired, so I apologize for that. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to run. There's actually a small bug in this, so let's hope it doesn't crash. But um, hopefully, I fix that too. Um, so I'm just going to actually show you the example. So again, unfortunately, no syntax highlighting. So I just have this file uh, resource at the top, and it has a template just printing out all the values, so you can actually see what happens when I pull the file. And then I'm building up this uh, this uh, hysteresis right here. And that's just a simple implementation. We might actually build this logic into the language itself, but for now, we just implemented it. And then right down here, I have a vert resource. So you can see this vert resource. It has um, one CPU, a certain amount of memory, and then the state can either be shut off or running. And that value, again, can change over time. And that value is going to change based on this Boolean, this unload variable. And that means it's going to check the value of the load, and if it's too high, it's going to shut down the VM. That might mean your, your server is oversubscribed, there's too many VMs running, so it's going to shut that down and potentially move it somewhere else. And when the load drops down below a threshold, then it's going to turn that VM back on. So this is actually, what is this actually? Have you built something like this before, perhaps? Let me show the demo. Auto-scaling. Auto-scaling, that's right. So here I've got this here. So I'm running this demo right here. So what I'm doing, I'm just running this uh, watch in a loop that prints out the file and does a verse list. And you can see right now that the threshold set to 1.5. The load on my machine is fairly low. And there's these two VMs that have booted up in response to me running MGMT. Um, and now, just to artificially increase the load, now, normally the VM could do some work. But because I want this to go faster, I'm just going to cause the load to increase on my machine by running all these yes commands and heat it up. So watch what happens. Watch what happens when we hit 1.5. So it's going up. Just to, so you believe me, I can actually even run top over here. So you know I'm not actually cheating. Those values are real. OK, 1.34. It's going up. OK, should be hitting there soon. Oh, boom. So it crossed the threshold. And you can see that one of the VMs disappeared because it shut it down. Now watch what happens. I just killed all those commands. The load is dropping back down. When it hits 1.5, it's not going to turn back on because it's got some hysteresis, right? So we don't flap back and forth. 1.52. I set it so there's 10 seconds of hysteresis. So we just drop below. Count 10 seconds in your head. Okay, about five more. Two, one, boom. And there it started the VM right back up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you like that? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, so this is the sort of thing that's possible. You can build these autoscalers, and you don't have to glue together Puppet and some other tool with a whole bunch of shell scripts. You can do this all in one safe language. And the beauty of that is you can type check the whole thing together and think about it and reason about it and know what's happening. And this is just one example. There's much more complex examples that you might want to be able to build. 
So I'm going to kill this. Do you want to see any more examples, or are you fed up? Can, can you show the code again? Please? Yep, I'll show you the code. I'm just going to kill these two VMs. Oops. Um, So, and all this is going to be on GitHub, so you can see this later. So, um, the, this, is the, this is basically the hysteresis implementation. So, we're basically looking if the load is bigger than the threshold, and if the load, the previous load, is also bigger than the threshold, and if the previous load is also bigger than the threshold, if any of those are true, then shut it down. And that just checks basically the last three values to make sure we're within that role. Okay? Yeah, quick question? I'll get to it. Uh, great question. I'll get to that in a sec. So hold your horses. Where's the, where's the 10 seconds come from? Hold your second. Hold on. I'll, I'll talk about this. Don't worry. It's a good question. Um, so just I want to talk to you about a few interesting language properties first, and then I'll answer those two questions, because that's in here. Um, so um, what's actually happening? As I said, the language is this reactive thing, which is pushing a new graph of resources every second or as often as it needs. It might only push one if it was just file package service and nothing ever changes, or you might want to choose to have some reactive properties. So it's kind of like a more general version of the puppet language in, in some respects. Um, it's a functional language, so all the types keep things very safe. And in theory, with this kind of language, we should be able to make sure that the language never actually crashes. But if, for example, we did have some reason where the language would crash and, and, and die, all that would happen is you wouldn't push a new graph to the engine. So hopefully nothing bad should actually happen. It would just stop making changes for you. Um, we'd like to eliminate these errors entirely, but I think, uh, I think we'll, even in the bad scenario, be fairly safe. Um, I showed you before that the code was actually out of order. And that's actually on purpose, just to be a little annoying. You shouldn't probably write your code that way, but as kind of like a spreadsheet, it actually forms a graph of what value goes to where and so on. And so the code, code actually can be out of order, and it would still actually work. We might actually decide to have a compile flag to actually say you must write code in the topological sort order, um, because if you were to write out of order code, you're kind of insane. But it is possible right now in the sort of pure form of the engine, initially, the language initially. So just something fun to mention. Uh, another property is variables are immutable. So if you did something like x equals 5 and then x equals 6, that would be a compile time error. And by preventing you from doing these sorts of things, it's actually not too unfamiliar in Puppet. We can actually eliminate a whole class of bugs entirely. So that's a fun thing. Um, the two gentlemen actually asked sort of about this. So hysteresis can allow us to uh, model real-time systems. And you can actually look at previous values, so what the last value was. And you could also actually ask uh, for a different kind of hysteresis, uh, excuse me, uh, historical value of what was the value 10 seconds ago and so on. And whether one is more useful than the other, it's still kind of researchy and exploratory, so I'm not sure what people will end up using the most, but both sorts of things are possible. So a really good question. Um, and lastly, because we have these reactive functions, these reactive variables, we can start modeling all sorts of things that they were kind of hard to do before. So we can actually model real-time things like load and so on, but we could also eventually model error scenarios. So you might think of the error state as a stream of no error until suddenly an error appears, or maybe um, the error stream as a collection of different errors which have a certain rate or percentage. So only when you hit a high enough error rate do you actually say, hey, maybe something very serious is wrong in my data center as opposed to just one machine which is on fire for some reason. Um, I have some more demos if you'd like to see, but it's up to you. You want to see some more demos? Yes. So, I have a few more demos. Um, let's start by showing you this demo. So, I have this idea, it's sort of the surprise. So, uh, I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow. So, what could you build on top of all this? Give me a hint. Scheduling. So, think about this for a second. So, look at these two examples. So, what does this sort of look like? This is Puppet. Um, no, I'm not trying to disparage Puppet. I'm just trying to make an analogy. Um, so Puppet actually has this explicit, I guess, statement for the node that says this particular node and then you do stuff, right? And if you compare that to something like this sort of thing, so this is sort of what you can do at the moment in MGMT. So host name is a variable. And so if the host name equals, you know, the particular thing you want, do stuff. And those are basically equivalent. But if you think about this, because this is all in the language as core 
uh, primitives and without a new node statement, you can actually do fancier things as well. So imagine you had something like this. So imagine, oops, there we go. Um, imagine if you had, um, if the host name was in the set of values which are returned by the schedule function. And so the schedule function actually can take a namespace, if you want to have a bunch of different schedulers, across your whole cluster, and a bunch of options. And then this would actually, every machine that runs the scheduler, that runs this code, would say, okay, my host name is there, put me in the pool of people that want, or machines that want to be scheduled. Um, and you can do some things like this. So we could have a strategy around Robin scheduler or something else. And you could say, Mac, so I want to, I want to schedule two machines in the cluster. Does that make sense? Let me show you, you want to see a demo of this? Yeah. Pretty, I've been thinking about this for a while, so it's kind of a new demo. So I'm getting, oops. I'm just gonna run this one at a time. So I'm gonna run the scheduler here. And again, these machines will automatically cluster together. And over here on the right, um, each machine is going to create its own file that just says what machines have been scheduled from its perspective, just to keep it simple so you can see the raw scheduler. So I'm running a tail and just running this over and over again. So you can see on the first machine, we actually just have this um, one machine which was chosen to be scheduled because there's no one else in the cluster. And if we run this on H2, watch what happens. The two machines are going to start up, cluster together. The first machine has decided to schedule code or resources to run on H1 or H2, and you can see that they agree. So both of them have decided to elect as a cluster using RAF protocol H1 and H2. We said we want up to two machines. There's only two machines available, so that's what we got. Um, what if I start up a third one? Do you want to see what I, happens if I start a third one? What's going to happen? Think in your head. Let's run it. So now you can see there's the third one, which is actually up and exists, and the scheduler has decided to only pick up to two. So H3 is out of luck. Nothing is happening on that machine. Um, but now, watch what happens if I actually kill the second one. So watch um, very quickly. Kill it. Now in this case, I have a TTL of 10 seconds. So you can see 10 seconds went by, and then it decided that the node was dead. Because depending on how you shut down the node, you can either shut down cleanly, or you can shut down violently and have it happen. So you can see now it's gone from H1 and H2 to H1 and H3, and H2 has disappeared. But if you start it back up, you can see now that everyone has agreed on H1 and H3. Does that make sense? Is that cool? <laughs> Thanks. Um, so again, this is just one reactive pattern which is possible in the language. There's many different ones. This is one thing. Um, maybe the implementation of my scheduler isn't even like a 100,000 host scalable scheduler, but it doesn't matter. If mine isn't good enough, I think it's pretty good. If mine isn't good enough, you could even write a new function, you know, scheduler high performance, for example, that has a function and does a different uh, scheduling decision based on something else. So there's an API for this in particular, and you can actually build completely different things. Um, other things you might want to build, uh, you might want to think about building locks. Um, and all sorts of crazy things where you actually pick um, out of a set of machines to do some operation on up to two at a time, and then when those machines are done, you take them out of the scheduler and do it on another two and so on. Does that sort of get your imagination going a little bit? Yeah? Is this way over everyone's head or is this cool? If you like this, I want to hear some applause. Yeah. So, so that's the thing, and uh, same sort of thing, if you, if you shut this down gently, um, you can see that it shuts down, and then via the TTL, it will pick that to H2. So you can play around with this um, if you like. Let's kill all this. I'm just going to kill this one violently. So I showed you that. Um, here's a quick plug. So I don't know if any one of you know Jonathan Gold. He's somewhere in the audience. Jonathan? Wave your hand. So Jonathan is a new MGMT contributor who's actually been um, writing all of the AWS stuff. And uh, he's unemployed, so this is a cheap plug for him to get a job. If you'd like to hire an MGMT contributor to write some code, he's a pretty smart guy. Um, that, that's, I said I would do this. Um, this is about getting you all involved. So how can you help? You can use this, you can test it, patch it, share it with your friends, document it. 
uh, star it on GitHub if you have GitHub, uh, tweet it if you have Twitter, um, say hey at Purple Idea or whatever or MGMT config, discuss it with your friends, hack on it, just hack on this stuff. Um, the unfortunate thing about this project, so I work for an apparel company uh, called Red Hat that you might have heard of. And I started this project before I was at Red Hat, but they really liked a lot of the designs and ideas. So they've been paying me for the last about two years or so. But unfortunately, because of political things due to some other products that they have, they've actually uh, completely killed my funding. So I'm here on my own dime traveling to present to you guys, and MGMT does not have a home. So if you want to help get involved by writing patches or funding this project, I'm not sure what the future is going to be, but I want to keep it open and something for the community. So you really have to get involved or this will die or become a proprietary thing, which would be, which would be bad. Um, let's just recap a few things. You can't really hear this, but it's Arthur Benjamin saying he's going to recap his pen, which is a really bad joke. Um, we have a IRC channel on Freenode. It's pretty cool, so you can join it and hang out with us. There's, I think, 60 or so of us in there right now. It's kind of fun. Um, we have a Twitter account, which sometimes people tweet stuff from, and a hashtag. And we have a very low volume mailing list where I announce things uh, about development and other stuff and discussion, so you can just join and talk about stuff. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things. You all know about the technical blog of James. Um, as of an hour ago, I've actually pushed a brand new blog post all about the language. So if you want to find out about how our type system works, the expressions, the statements that are available, and a whole lot of technical things, check it out. It's all there right now, and you can watch it. Um, GitHub, um, all of, that's the GitHub project. There's another recording of the language that I did very recently, um, and an older engine demo if you want to see everything about the engine. And obviously, Purple Idea, um, on, the, on the Purple Idea blog, you can actually find um, a whole bunch of other articles about MGMT and other things. Uh, me, I'm Purple Idea on IRC and Twitter and GitHub and at gmail.com and so on. So if you want to contact me, I'm easy to find. Um, do you want to see one last demo or are you fed up? Yes. We could either break right now or you could see one last demo. Okay, yeah. I'll tell you what, I'm going to show you two more demos and they're going to be... <laughs> Bad? No, they're... they're... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you one just because I want to get you thinking about stuff. So, um, so I have this, uh, this is, a, I know you're the kind of audience that would appreciate this. I was going to only show this tomorrow, but I kind of want to show it today. So here's some code I wrote. Again, sorry, no lack of syntax highlighting. If you know how to make Zim, Vim or Gedit uh, syntax editing, please let me know. You can probably just use like set FT, PHP. FT? Okay, well, that's slightly better. <laughs> so it's, it's embarrassing that my language is plausibly similar to Perl. <laughs> that was not the idea. Um, we're going to have to talk later, so that's totally not the idea. Anyways, so that's, that's a good idea. So let's, can you see the blue? All right, so let's just see what's happening. I want you to see this. So here's just some namespace variable, just some random string. I have this key value lookup function which returns some sort of type. So types are actually precise and static here. So there's this the sort of coercing of types and Puppet and Python. Those things are not allowed. They're very specific, strict things. Um, and there's this, this is this map lookup thing, which is actually going to be a, have a syntactical thing in the language, just looking up a key in a map. So in this map that gets returned from KV lookup, look up our host name, and if we don't find something, equal default. So forget about that for a moment. Look at this part down here. That state that we get is this value here. So if the state equals 1, put that state string in a file so we can see that. And then run this uh, kv resource, which actually puts something in the database, and set that to 2. And that's what that state value is. And if it's set to 2, then it's reactive. So it's going to actually then realize that it has to run this part. State 2, it's going to put 2 in the file, put it to state 3. If we get to state 3, What's going to happen? It's going to put it back to state one. So what have we actually built here? Uh, it's a state machine oscillator, actually. So um, let's see what actually happens. Should we run this? Let's run this. Um, so, oh. so this is actually what's happening. It's going really, really fast. 
One, two, three, one, two, three. In fact, it's going faster than you, than you can actually tell over here. So it's actually skipping values when you see here. And that's kind of absurd, right? So this whole thing is something that we're going to hopefully be able to model and think about in the language. But the truth is, some people say, oh, you can build these things. These are dangerous. It turns out these are actually some of the patterns, obviously not this speed, that we might want to model in real life, right? So thinking about how things evolve over time, maybe the state machine actually moves quite slower. So during the weekday, you know, if date time equals something on the weekday, turn up services. But when we get to the Friday or the weekend, make things read-only, so you have kind of read-only Friday and a safer weekend. Um, all these sorts of things change over time, they oscillate, and they're possible. And, and I want to model these complex distributed things because they need to be done somewhere. We fundamentally want to build these systems. We want to build the storage cluster that automatically deals with failure scenarios and provisions new machines to fix those things without having a pager go off. The pager should only go off when you have a, oh my goodness, there is a bug in my code scenario, and the system does not know how to fix itself. So real autonomous systems is, is sort of what I'm getting at. So just something to think about. I know people are going to be angry that oscillators are possible, but you're going to have to live with it, because this is going to happen. <laughs> so I just have one last demo. You want to see one very last demo? Yeah. OK, it's really fast. So Felix, I think. So this is the feature branch of MGMT. I'm just going to check out git master. I think you go merge feet lang, and then you go git push. Let's see what happens. There you go. So everything is now in git master on GitHub. You can play with this. You can hack on this with your friends. This is not perfect. The language is not finished. There are still a few more things that need doing. And the standard library is also uh, not very big at the moment. But this is early. This is now something you should start using and learning about and playing with um, and getting involved with. So. Like? It does not. You can go look online. I don't take legal. I don't. I don't take legal questions during my talk. This is a technical talk. Um, so uh, a few plugs. So tomorrow, um, in the MGMT Dev Room. So not in this room. There's going to be another room. There are going to be three more talks. I'm going to give an even more advanced talk, showing you some scary stuff. Uh, Jonathan Gold, who the gentleman over there, is going to present his work on EC2. So kind of like Terraform, we can actually do these cloud services as well, but they're reactive. So think about what that means and how that could happen. Uh, think about kind of, imagine you had a whole bunch of different cloud resources and over time you actually gradually just moved and shift things in real time. Things were quite fun. And Felix, uh, Felix, wave over here. I don't have a photo of you, sorry. Felix did some lovely work uh, taking existing puppet code and compiling it to run on our engine. Um, He's going to give a great talk about that. So hopefully, you can actually have a migration path if you want to make your puppet code go really, really fast. So something to think about. Uh, here's a joke that Jonathan might like, because he's a real magician. I'm just a fake magician. Um, as I said, oh, I have this talk again. Great talks tomorrow. And um, these are the talks and the time. So don't miss these. Be on time, please. And on the day after, there's a hackathon. So I have a sort of tentative schedule here, just of if you want to actually learn how to build a new core resource, if you want to actually learn how to write a new core function, um, and just general getting started with MGMT, getting it building and playing around. I'm going to go through all of these things, answer all the questions you like, and we'll be around for open hacking all day from 10 AM. So if you want to come, check it out. Um, last thing. I want you to help me do a distributed denial of service on Chris. So this is Chris. He, um, if, you like, if you like my talk, if you like what I'm doing, take three seconds, go up to Chris, say, Chris, I just need to talk to you for something. I really liked Purple Ideas talk. If you all did this, it would be awesome. And Chris would, would you know, feel love and also annoyed ever so fun. So <laughs> got to bother him. He's a good guy, but you know, DDoS him. Thank you very much. <laughs>